My guests today on It's a Lawyer's Life are George Butler from Portugal Bedford Row. Afternoon. And Heather Lofty, also from Portugal Bedford Row. Morning, in case you have a different time zone. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Now, George, um, coming to you first of all, you are a family law practitioner and you, your work includes both private and public law, financial remedies and also direct access work. Yep, that's true. And Heather, you were a solicitor. You were on the dark side at one time. Yes, I was. <laughs> And for those people who might not know, because we have a, an international following, uh, about the split profession that we have in this country, um, would you like to explain what it is? So I think it's probably something that um, is merging more and more, but people have been saying it's been merging for the past 200 years. <laughs> yeah. Quite. Um, um, here we have sisters and barristers. Mm -hmm. We have solicitor advocates, which sort of start to cross the divide a little bit. Um, and we have barristers who accept direct access, but um, the the general approach is that the solicitors um, are more day-to-day, uh, -to -day, hands on with the cases. They they are um, more directly um, involved with the clients from from the very outset. And most barristers require to take um, most barristers need instructing by solicitors unless you have something like direct access but it gives the solicitors the sort of first port of call um, and then referral on to barristers for, for expert advice on more narrow areas of expertise than a solicitor who um, frequently has to deal with a much wider range of, of issues. And George, often the analogy of a GP and a specialist is used, do you think that's a, a good one? Well, I, I always say solicitors do the work and we get all the glory. Um, yeah. The whole point about being a barrister is that you are essentially the trial attorney, as the Americans might call it. You're the person who goes to court. You're the person who drafts the complicated advice because you've got the expert opinion, um, or at least that's what's suggested. And solicitors do the day-to-day -day work. They're the ones who meet the clients. They're the ones who file the applications. And what we're not allowed to do as barristers is litigation. It took me a long time to work out what that was. But we're not allowed to issue applications. We're not allowed to turn up to court and pay deposits. So we can't do any of the practical stuff as a matter of our regulations, practicing regulations. Um, what we do is we turn up to court, we advise you, and we, we do all the cross-examination and the fun stuff. And one of the controversial things that people believe about the split profession is that somehow barristers are above solicitors. Oh, well, that's clearly <laughs> <laughs> Well, well you, you were a solicitor at one time, so did was that something that you came across and it really annoyed you? Um, I think actually most people, it may be an external view of the profession, but I think within the legal profession, it's not a very widely held um, view at all. Um, and I, I'm, I'm surprised by how different it is in many ways. And, uh, you know, th there isn't this merge that we've all expected there mm. to be. Um, and solicitors are just as specialised and just as, so I said to you earlier that you know, we have probably a wider range, but there are some solicitors who do even narrower ranges than even the most specialist of barristers do. So, um, and, you know, solicitors on the whole have good reputations just as much as barristers on the whole have good reputations. I think it's something that's uh, maybe something seen as outside the legal profession of people looking in, um, but I don't think it's something on the whole that that um, is, ha is a thought that's held within the profession. And, and George, you now do direct access work. I do. And essentially, clients can come to you directly. Yeah, they can. And, and how does it work? It depends on what kind of, you know, how you want to run your own business. As I've said before, we can't do litigation. Mm -hmm. So what normally happens is that there'll either be an approach made to the clerks or someone will have gone on the website and seen you. And they'll say, I need a lawyer for this hearing. Um, I don't want to pay a solicitor to do all of the legwork and do all of the other bits, but I need someone to turn up on the day, give me advice, and talk to the judge, for want of a better word. So um, what I tend to do is I'll speak to them on the phone a lot. Um, there'll be quite a lot of emails going backward and forward. There'll be a lot of, you need to get this thing done or that thing done. So you might have to tell someone that you've got to go to your GP and see whether they'll fill out this form for you. And if they won't, dot, dot, dot. A lot of my time is spent trying to minimise costs because the whole point about direct access is it keeps costs down. All you're doing is paying for me to turn up to court. 
what you're not doing is paying for a solicitor who's normally running on an hourly rate to um, fill out forms, to issue applications, to give you day-to-day -day advice, also probably to hold your hand. There's much less hand-holding in terms of direct access. Now, the other area of work that you do is private and public law. And I had a discussion with someone um, who wanted to make a documentary, and he really had no idea about the difference. <laughs> and, and I know all the lawyers, uh, family lawyers uh, watching will know, but, but just generally, what is the difference? When people talk about private law, they're talking about disputes between private individuals. So that could be, who's your child going to live with? Can you take them to another part of the country? Can you take them to a different country? Um, it might be money work, but that's, that's normally considered under the heading of financial remedies. But private law is anything that takes place between two separated parties who are going to argue about their children, mostly. Public law is totally different. Public law is when local authorities become involved in you and your children, and it's when the local authority wants to make some kind of application that affects the way in which you exercise your parental responsibility. And often it's care proceedings. So it's children being taken into care. Um, it's a completely different beast. And you would act for which party? I would say rather um, um, obliquely whoever pays me. Um, but because in most of those cases, in fact all of them now, if it's private law, you get paid privately and you don't choose. If it's public law, you get paid by the public purse, by legal aid, or by local authorities. And unless you have a strong view that you don't want to represent local authorities, I take whichever brief comes along, which is in line with what the barristers known as the cab rank rule, mm -hmm. which is the idea that you take the next case that comes along, and it doesn't matter whether you like your client, whether you like the look of the case, you get the next one along and you take it. And Heather, when you were a solicitor, you were a specialist in insurance. But now you cover a wider range of, of work. And one of the areas that you practice in is discrimination. And what would you say are the most common areas of discrimination that people seek uh, applications in? Um, I think it's such a broad range. Um, my, my discrimination practice in, um, when I was a solicitor more than, than now. Um, and I, that, I think, is, is replicated in general practice in um, insurance solicitor life. Um, you see much more of the kind of front end of things um, when you see the to, rather in comparison to the to the towards the end of, of history um, and you see I saw a lot of dis uh, discrimination in relation to disability mm -hmm. um, in particular um, I think probably if you spoke to the employment uh, team here um, they'd say much more in the realms of um, gender discrimination, sexual discrimination in the in employment context. I, I tended to work in an insurance context about uh, you know, claims for discrimination, about uh, lack of access to services. And so that's the, the real distinction um, of the type of things that you see in practice, the bar in discrimination, I think, in, in comparison to as a solicitor. And, and George, having talked a little bit about barristers and solicitors, have you ever wanted to be a solicitor? Uh, no, I've never wanted to be a solicitor. Um, I didn't really know that I wanted to be a barrister. I, I just sort of chanced my arm in my early 30s and thought, you know, I can stand and I can talk. And it looked like the kind of job that I could do. Um, I, didn't think I, I don't think I thought out my career path that clearly. And, and Heather, having done both? Let me back. Let me go back. No, um, it's it's very different life, actually. Um, you know, as we say, you, you think these things are commonplace, just become the same thing, but they're not at all. Um, there are good things about being a solicitor and there are good things about being a barrister just as much because they're both both bad things they've got bad things on both sides as well but um, definitely prefer being a barrister and now moving on to something far more important and that <laughs> is style and court attire now we've had some discussions haven't we about what is appropriate and what is not appropriate and you're both very stylish people and George you are there with your fabulous suit and Heather you're looking lo lovely if I said to you, to finish this sentence, a lawyer should look... Smart. Heather? Yeah, I said smart at the beginning. Professional. Yeah. Um, and, and what does that mean in, in real terms for, for each of you? Well, I think for me, the idea is that you need to be reassuring towards your client. So um, I had to take my eyebrow piercings out when I became a barrister, uh -huh. for example. I don't think that would have worked very well. 
Um, and it depends on the client. So uh, I think within a, a month of, of qualifying, getting on my feet, I bought my first pinstripe suit and it was blue with a big thick chalk and I was doing a lot of magistrates court work and I used to think of it as my magistrate suit because if you turn up at the cells and you've got a client who's you know in there for robbery or section 20 or whatever that's you know hitting some with a hammer they want to know that the person who's turned up to represent them is what I think they would call a proper brief mm. and when I was junior that was my proper brief suit um, today I'm wearing my um, um, ancillary relief my money suit um, so this is the one that I'll put on if I've got a client who's paying me quite well and I want to make sure that, in fact, the best I can say is the judge and I were in similar <laughs> pinstripe suits today. We both had smart ties and we both had little um, handkerchiefs as well spotting out the top. Now you can do a trick with your handkerchief, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, people often talk about pocket squares, which is very stylish and young men wear them, but right. when I started buying suits and wanting to get handkerchiefs that either matched or were contrasting, I was told that what you need to do is take your hanky, and this one, by the way, went through the wash, and that's once tie dyed. Um, it's it didn't, pretty pr impressive, though, isn't it? I didn't buy it like that, but you put your finger in like that. Looks like you're doing a the magic trick. The rabbit comes out of the hat. That's right. And then finger in, and what you do, turn the bottom, and then you've got a little flower. Wow. Like a rose, a rather variegated rose. And that then sits in your top pocket, and um, either looks very smart or um, people sort of laugh at you. I haven't had a client walk off with one of these in the past. <laughs> now, you, you've mentioned your magistrate's court suit and your ancillary mm -hmm. relief suit, but is, is that actually, Hannah, something that you do as well? You consciously think, I'm in the high court today, I'm going to wear my best suit, or if I'm in another lower court, I'm going to wear something less. Yeah, I, I think I think it also depends, as you say, that if you're, um, you want a proper brief mm. or you want a money case, mm. but you, you have to be sympathetic and sensitive to the type of case that you're doing and the type of client you have um, and their particular interests and also the audience you have in the shape of the judge um, and there's nothing worse I think than turning up at court and wearing something that is distracting to the judge or I just that would be a nightmare um, and you also want to present a good image of yourself and your profession um, I go as far as to have a um, posher suitcase for travelling with my papers. Um, if I know it's going into court, sometimes the, uh, the slightly posher, less beaten up uh, suitcase will be um, removed from its lovely cellophane. I don't have any cellophane, that's one thing. Um, but, that, you know, it's a rucksack sort of smaller, for the lower um, court. Yes, and sometimes it's practicality because, you know, you need uh, less papers in the lower court, potentially, so you don't need to lug around an enormous suitcase. Um, but certainly I would make sure that I didn't have a suitcase that was completely falling apart if I was in front of some you know, bear garden or something. But if you're representing, like you talked about a judge's response, and there's an anecdote, and I'd like to think it's about me, but I honestly can't remember, um, turning up to court in the blue chalk striped suit when I was very junior, and having a judge go, oh, look, it's Mr. Stripey. <laughs> so you've got to be just a little bit careful. <laughs> And you've got to be able to carry it off. Yeah. Um, and I think that the older you get and the fatter your girth, the more you are able, especially if you're a, a male barrister, to carry yeah. off th those sorts of suits that scream Rumpole of the Bailey or, you know, Chancery Division have a very, very different look to uh, the family division. Yeah. You know, people do dress in a very specific way. And what would you say is a complete no-no? Because I've seen purple polo necks under a black um, suit. <laughs> I've seen leopard skin print which I don't think is quite right. Sequins, jodhpur. Well, well, I, feel, I feel very, very um, uh, nervous about commenting at all on female counsel's attire. Um, although I know that a pupil supervisor of mine, a pupil mistress as they used to call them, um, had a complete nightmare when um, anyone wore pattern tights. So they were absolutely um, out for her. As a, as, a, as a guy, I think you can get away with a lot more than you can uh, within the constraints of wearing a suit, of course. Um, but I think no-nos are that you mustn't smell. So mm. hygiene. Um, you can look crumpled. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, all the looks carry with them a sense of... Um, well, I, 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 again, I once had to turn up to court receiving a call saying, Mr. Bartley, you're in, you're in at 10.30. And I turned up to work without a suit. I had a denim... I was wearing jeans and a T-shirt 
and I had the good fortune to have a, 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 a just like a, a, a lounge jacket um, in corduroy, brown corduroy jacket. So I ran up Chancery Lane, stopped off, bought a shirt, put the shirt on as I got into court, and turned up, and I looked like a geography teacher. <laughs> that was a moment. I mean, I apologise to I said, Judge, I wasn't expecting to be here in the judgment, and I can see that. And also to geography teachers. Well, perhaps, if yes. Any who might be watching. Indeed, indeed. I, Heather, I heard a colleague once say, and she's now in, in the Court of Appeal, uh, an appeal court judge, so um, she's got something right, that she changed her lipstick according to who she was cross-examining. Red for someone who was going to be difficult, pink for someone who was a little vulnerable. <laughs> well, I think you certainly have to be sensitive. If you've got someone who's vulnerable, it's not the sort of work I, I do, I'm old, but um, if you've got a, a vulnerable child witness or somebody, um, wearing you know, potent red lipstick um, is probably going to be somewhat intimidating to a six-year-old child witness that you might have to be cross-examining or speaking to. Um, also, again, it's distraction. I think the thing that all of us are conscious of is it's not about us. Mm. We're, we're the mouthpiece for whoever's sat behind us or whoever's instructed us. So, um, yes, as a bar, uh, the bar as a species are, I think, almost as a stick through, cut through a stick of rock We've all got individuality in us. That, that's the only way you can be a barrister in reality. Um, but we're also absolutely conscious of you know, presenting the profession and presenting our client. Yeah. That's more important. Um, and so if you're going to turn up and, and look scruffy, for want of a better word, or something that doesn't look professional, it's not just a reflection on you, it's a reflection on the person that you are representing, whether they're sat behind you or not. And you don't want to be remembered for being the girl with you know, leopard, leopard skin print, bright red lips and sandals. <laughs> yes, well, I think, I think the other point about that, though, is that if you're going to dress like a peacock, you've got to be bloody good. Yes, yeah. yes, there yeah. is that to it. Well, I know that both of you are very good and um, it has been brilliant to interview you. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll, we'll continue this discussion another time about another topic. Indeed. Thank you very much, George. Thank you very much, Heather. And Thank good you. luck in both your respective careers. You're welcome. Thanks very much. Thank you.